walked for days at first, through death and through birth. The years were counting toward, but none from just before. Our sense is tight and keen, the years are sharp and mean. It used to be so soft, to morph into machines. Get out of town, soon as now. Get out while there's still time to cut loose hair. Everywhere you go, you're in the movie now. You already know. Hold me now, I'm freezing. Help me now, I'm reeling. Who has ever felt so alive? Nature so unkind to linger so discreet and open up so wide, flooding every street. So granular the dream, each ray of light a song, each mode of dust upon. I sing to carry on, get out of town as soon as now. Get out while there's still time to cut loose hair. Yeah, all the world's a stage, the patterns. Change we seek with wild desire through water and through fire. Hold me now, I'm freezing. Help me now, I'm freezing. Who has ever felt so alive? town further miles down and through the scope you'll see the light of future dreams each road a wooden path the trees on either side the stars are still our guide in this lonely aftermath get out of town as soon as now get out while there's still time to cut loose yeah i dream of olden times well inside today, is it fortunate to die, sufficient to survive, hold me now, I'm freezing, help me now, I'm freezing, who has ever felt so high, hold me now, I'm freezing, help me now. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. We on? We're on. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Tree Swenson. I'm the executive director of Hugo House, and it's really fantastic. <laughs> Yay, Hugo House. <laughs> um, it's just, it's such a pleasure. This is the first literary series of our season. It's a great lineup, and it's just an amazing kickoff with Joy Mills music and Megan Daum and Soma Sharif and Sonora Ja. It's just awesome. I'm really excited about it. And we're really thrilled to be here at Fred Wildlife Refuge. You guys rock. We love you. It's just, it's a, it's just a, it's a really cool space. And it's really important for us because Hugo House is in temporary housing right now. So um, we're actually uh, uh, located most of the time right next door to the Fry Art Museum which um, we are very grateful to them for uh, the fact that we have a great temporary location. And I think um, many of you probably know, but I'm always a little startled to find out how many people don't know that um, right now Hugo House is busy designing a space that will be a permanent home for writers. 
um, and we're working with NBBJ, these great architects, to try to imagine what's the perfect space? What does Seattle need? What do, what do writers need? So we're, we're thinking about, okay, we need places where passionate readers and writers can gather together to, to you know, plumb the intricacies of uh, character development or plot and where writers of all ages can um, come together, find, you know, listen to both new talents and renowned literary stars. We need, um, we, need, we, need, we need places for everyone to come and find a quiet corner where they can hone their ideas or find the best words to, to express them. So we're planning to move into that brand new home um, summer of 2018, which feels like it's around the corner. Um, and this is really a huge project because Hugo House is really kind of a small organization, but um, everything that's worth doing is, is uh, a huge project, right? So um, we're determined to pull everything together, raise the money to make this whole thing happen um, because, because writers really need Hugo House and Seattle really needs writers and artists of all stripes. So. And if you'd like to know more about the project, please catch me at intermission or afterwards or shoot me an email, tree at hugohouse.org. I'm happy to talk about this project. It's really pretty exciting. Um, please, if you would, fill out surveys at intermission. Our funders are always asking us who comes to the events, what do they think of the events? So um, those funders include Amazon Literary Partnership, um, Arts Fund, the Office of Arts and Culture, For Culture, Arts Washington, Boeing, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, the Sorrento Hotel and our media sponsors, uh, Strangers a and and KUOW. So with that, I would like to bring up noted novelist and our events curator, Peter Mountford. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Tree. Um, let's see. Hi, everyone. You can keep ordering drinks if you want to. Um, we are so grateful to Fred. Uh, they are, you know, really a great. Um, it's a cool space, and they're really generous with us. And part of how we repay them is um, by drinking expensive drinks. So you don't have to drink a lot. You just have to get the good stuff. Um, and um, also, uh, we have books for sale from Elliott Bay, and Open Books are here. It's open Books is Seattle's poetry-only bookstore, which is a really cool thing. And yeah, and Elliott Bay is the best bookstore in the world, and so they're both here. So if you buy books, you're supporting them and the authors and Hugo House, and it's really cool. And there's also really good stuff to read. Um, so um, thank you all, and yes, I'm excited for the first lit series of the season, um, and it's gonna be a great season. Um, please, if you have phones, please silence them, and also um, turn them off, or put duct tape over the screens, whatever you have to do to make them so they don't glow. Um, and thank you, I'll do that when I have sit down again. Um, and, uh, yeah, I want to tell you about some exciting stuff we have coming up in the next couple months before I get started um, talking about the event tonight. Um, we have, I think, 24, possibly more events in the next like two and a half months, including book launches, readings, lectures, lots of great things, craft talks. Um, and one of them is on October 13th. Mary Rufel um, is, uh, as many of you know, uh, is an amazing poet and also essayist, and she, um, her event was sold out, but then we realized that we could sell a few more seats, and so it became unsold out briefly, uh, and it will remain unsold out for, it might, I don't know how long, but not long, um, but if you want to get tickets to that, that's on October 13th at the Fries, where that's going to be happening, her craft talk, and there's a, she's teaching a class the next day that is six hours, six hours, um, and that's amazing, um, I find her slightly intimidating, but she's also really brilliant. And you can spend six hours in a room with her and um, get your work workshopped. Um, and so there's still seats in that class. Um, we have many, many classes, I think like 70-ish this quarter. And a lot of them are filling up. We just had Kelly Link here last week and her class was filled. Jess Walters is full, Megan's is full, um, many, many others. Um, so register early and often and um, don't miss out. Um, 
So the format for the evening is that I'm talking right now, and after that, I will introduce um, the, well, we're going to have, so um, I'm going to introduce Sonora in a minute, and she's going to get up. Sonora Jaw is going to get up and read for a bit, and then we're going to have another song uh, from Joy Mills, and then after, and there'll be a little bit of an intermission in case you want to get more expensive cocktails. Um, and then after that, uh, we're going to have more music and finally Megan Dom. Um, and uh, did I say Solmaz? I did, yeah. I'm reading my script. I didn't? Oh, Solmaz, then more music, then Megan Dom. There you go. Um, so tonight, as you probably know, the way the event works is it's sort of like Ameri This American Life, but for literature. Um, we have three authors and a musician, all who make work on the same theme, which Hugo House assigns. And then the authors come here and the musician and present it all for the first time tonight. Um, and tonight's theme is sequels. And the whole season this year has a kind of overarching theme of transitions because of what Tree was talking about, the new facility. And there's a little bit of real estate uh, thrown in there um, as well. And so we have themes this year of homecoming uh, in March. And the next one that we're having is in November, and that's Area Patrolled by Neighborhood Watch. Um, and uh, in terms of sequels, we asked ICE, tonight's artist to think about writing a sequel to some piece of their own work, or perhaps a sequel to someone else's work. But as we always, uh, as always, we understand that um, and are really happy if they veer from the assigned sort of plot. Because I mean, I've done that myself. I once had a situation where I was asked to write a bedtime story. I was telling the authors on the way here, a bedtime story that was on the theme of something that goes bump in the night. And I turned in a story that was about like a person who may, whose girlfriend may or not be real. She was like maybe an imaginary person and they lived in like a house that they had stolen on the coast of Oregon. I'm afraid it was not a bedtime story. It had nothing to do with going, things going bump in the night. But that was what I tried to do. Um, so sequels. Um, frustrated by J.D. Salinger's refusal to publish anything after his super bizarre and very, very long short story from 1965, which was called Hapworth, 19, it was Hapworth 16, a Swiss writer named Frederick Colting boldly wrote a sequel to Catcher in the Rye called Coming Through the Rye. And then he got the living daylight suit out of him by Salinger, no surprise, who during the last 50 years of his life only really ventured out of his backyard bunker to sue someone or pick up a sandwich from the local deli. <laughs> Appropriation sequels are fraught business for this reason. But sequel sequels like where you sequel yourself are also sometimes fraught. Like a failure of imagination, people sort of say, oh, you're just riffing on something you haven't, you know. But I think that, you know, it's, it's not that simple. And I think it can be a beautiful form. The great poet Wislawa, I can never get her name pronounced properly, but Simborska, Wislawa Simborska. Did I get her right? Tree's nodding. Tree knows. Um, pretty close. Uh, Every beginning, she wrote, every beginning is only a sequel after all, and the book of events is always open halfway through. That is, echoing ourselves is inevitable. It's how we grow through iteration and re-examination. It's not just essential to the creative process, it's essential to life. There's my two cents on the matter. So, to our first reader. Um, Sonora Ja is the author of the novel Foreign, which is amazing, and was published in 2013 by Random House India. She is a professor of journalism and media studies at Seattle University, formerly a journalist in India and Singapore. Her recent political essays and op-eds have been published in The New York Times, The Seattle Times, Seattle Weekly, and The Globalist. Apart from her academic journalistic writing, she recently finished her second novel, Go oh, Sonora, yeah, it's exciting. Um, Sonora is currently starting her second year um, at, as Hugo House's prose writer in residence, and she often teaches at Hugo House. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks. I'm gonna jump right in. In the sequel to Our Failed Marriage, we actually keep our wedding vows. I wrote those vows for both of us. You said you trusted me to write them, 
because I am a writer. Those vows are, to date, my cutest work of fiction. <laughs> I pulled them together from the wedding vows suggested by the Arya Samaj, where confused Hindus go when they marry outside their faith. The Arya Samaj is a reform movement, and it felt just right for the two of us who needed so much reform, together and apart, that our therapists and counselors and the John Gottman Institute trained specialists <laughs> stepped wildly outside their professional codes of conduct and actually begged us not to marry. <laughs> we read our vows out loud together. Our voices rose high and proud over the attempted upstaging of our wedding by the fucking blue angels. <laughs> we began to sound declarative, like two generals announcing a truce where bodies had fallen, but were now promising to have and to hold. Our family and our friends loved, loved, loved our vows. I knew they would. So I had turned them into scrolls to be handed out to our wedding guests as they arrived, pink writing on gold paper, tied with gold tassels, exotic little motifs that I had my mother bring from the embroidery markets of Mumbai. We didn't know it then, as we stood there so beautiful in a rose garden in Kirkland, a brown woman in a peach and gold sari who had put her white man triumphantly in a royal blue kurta that our marriage wouldn't make it to the first wedding anniversary. I would leave a month before we reached that milestone. We were wrong, we were wrong to marry. Now I was getting my second divorce. Clearly, I could never go back to India with such colossal failures in the West. We are supposed to huddle close to family as immigrants, and I had thrown it all asunder twice over. The vows of the Arya Samaj, called the Saptapadi, or the seven steps, that the bride, grew, bride and groom walk together at the wedding ceremony, tell the couple to each have the same thoughts, same desires, and same aspirations as they walk and recite hymns, which express the principal duties of householders. I don't think you and I, in the 12 years we have known each other, have had the same thought about a single damn thing. Not on politics, not on culture, not on John Wayne or Shah Rukh Khan, not on beaches versus mountains, not on guns versus yoga, not on cities versus suburbs. And yet, there we were, speaking that first vow to provide for each other food, clothing, and home. Nope, not on condos versus farms. The second step we took carried the vow to develop our physical, mental, and spiritual powers. I found out that my mental and spiritual powers are best developed in solitude. When I called my cousin in Toronto to tell him I couldn't bear to be married anymore, that I couldn't bear marriage, he asked me, not even bothering to mask the exasperation in his voice, couldn't you know this before you got married? <laughs> no, I said in a small voice, I couldn't, how could I? Short of knowing we are not supposed to break a marriage, do we ever know if we can actually bear one? In the year following our divorce, I grew my mental powers by staring up at my bedroom ceiling and crying. Then you called me, and we took a second step toward each other. Like fools, we started dating. And we are still dating now, 12 years after we first met, and four years after our divorce. We joined a gym last December and grew our physical powers there together. We don't get the family discount at the gym because we are divorced. <laughs> and capitalism doesn't recognize the cool new spiritual powers of our reunion. <laughs> but we are the only couple that arrives at the gym, waves out happily, and kisses before we get on the treadmill. That ought to count as a warm-up. The third step we took in our wedding vow performance stated, we increase our wealth by righteous means for proper use. Which brings me back to capitalism. We fought over money when we were married. You wanted to go in on a property with your siblings in San Diego. I wanted a new bed for us. 
I didn't want a, new, a joint bank account, so you didn't want a house together. We looked at each other through the concrete of our eyes, houses that had run out of water. I left and bought myself a condo. Now I share my wealth there with you by cooking us meals of salmon and spinach omelets. You invite me to your backyard where we cook biryani on hot coals and you serve me bourbon vanilla pancakes in bed. That same old bed. I feel righteous. You put the wealth of your kitchen skills to proper use. The fourth step, to acquire knowledge, happiness, and harmony by mutual love and trust. Are you kidding me, Arya Samaj? You just go and pack the whole universe into one tiny step? I'll have to come back to this one. Moving on. Fifth step, to be blessed with strong, virtuous, and heroic children. Strong children. We already had one each from our previous marriages. Your little daughter was my bridesmaid. My son said he was excited because he had never been to a wedding before. My mother still finds this one of the funniest things she's ever heard, a boy excited about his mother's wedding. We made a beautiful family portrait at the wedding. Blonde-haired man, black-haired woman, blonde-haired daughter, black-haired son, blended family, distinct hair. I heard you tell a sales clerk at Best Buy once that you were looking for some sort of metal for your son's science project. You said son, not stepson. I fought to breathe. You were a good man. You were a good man, and I already knew at Best Buy that I was going to leave. I would take your new son with me. I'm going to say something here that you won't like. I believe our children are stronger more virtuous, even heroic, from our separation. Let me finish. They are stronger for our separation. And there has to be some virtue that will reveal itself in them in the years to come, developed in watching us as we returned with helplessness to our love. They are heroic for forgiving us and taking us back. The sixth step we took was for self-restraint and longevity. We are failing miserably at this. I do not stick to my paleo diet, and we are hurtling toward an early death from the drama of our existence. <laughs> and I do not count as self-restraint the fact that neither you nor I have made love to another person since we met, even in the years we were freed by divorce. It isn't self-restraint if it took no restraining. You wanted no one but me. I tried Tinder, but could not bring myself to want anyone else. But the thing I started to miss first were your teeth. You used to find it funny how, in the early days of our love, I liked to pry your jaw open and lift your lips to look at the collection of your teeth, run my finger over this one or that. I peered in envy at the way your gums hugged your enamel in a perfect display of health, while mine, in a gradual sickness of my gums, made me grow long in the tooth. You attempted to talk through the dental examination at my hands. Is this an Indian thing, you asked. <laughs> no, I said, it's a me thing. What I should have said is, it's a me thing with you. Perhaps our marriage failed because we didn't complete our sentences. Perhaps all of us, instead of looking for a partner with whom we complete each other's sentences, ought to linger with the one we have, slow down, to follow a thought and complete our own sentence. I have stopped fighting with married people on Facebook. I have started to wonder about them. How are they keeping this together? Who are they together? Who would they have been apart? I know I am pure evil to have such questions about these people so madly in love. Yes, all of them married to their best friends. <laughs> Yes, I'm worse than Trump evil, who clearly believes in the institution of marriage and motherhood and definitely apple pie. But you and I, and mostly I, have done more to soil the institution of marriage than all the gays were supposed to do. People like me keep America from becoming great again. I thought my country had trained me to be married. Marriage in my country is like water, everywhere like water from the river Ganga, 
holy, polluted, without sin, receiver of death, source of all birth. How did this daughter of the Ganga swim so far away? In this sequel, You and I Are Living Now, I tell you that I don't know how far we will make it this time around. You shrug and you tell me you understand. So we no longer speak of longevity. We spend short evenings together in which I watch you throw all your body and soul into playing with my dog, and it takes all my restraint not to bite both of you hard with my rotting teeth and my aching love. And so we stumble upon the seventh and final vow, in which we swore to make us true companions and remain lifelong partners through this wedlock. In the sequel to our wedding vows, I ask that we remove those three little words, through this wedlock. You are still my truest companion. I plan to be your lifelong partner. I will take you one day to sit by me on the banks of the Ganga, when they ask who you are to me, I will say, he is the one I swim with. You see, I love you. That's the three-word key, isn't it? More worthy than the lock of wedded bliss. You are not convinced. You can't help it. You are Irish Catholic. Your ancestors in British India probably held a gun to the head of an Arya Samaji to write that fourth vow the one I said I'd come back to, acquire knowledge, happiness, and harmony by mutual love and trust. Actually, the Arya Samaji probably negotiated the word knowledge in there as a pursuit, but I digress. Happiness, harmony, love, trust. In the sequel to our wedding vows, all I can promise is that I will mull on these words. Words are the tools of my trade. But this isn't the first time I've wondered, do writers really know how to love? Wait, I can make that sentence better. Do writers know how to really love? Yes, see what happens when I move a single word around? Oh, but in the sequel to our failed vows, I promise not to let words get ahead of me. I won't put pen to paper before I have paused to truly consider how, how words fatten themselves into vows and how vows thin out into empty words. Love is in the mulling. Perhaps, after all, love is in the staying, in the gums and enamel of it all. From this day forward, I vow to pry open and examine the days behind us and find us a dream that don't ask no question. You knew I would work in some Neil, Di Neil Diamond lyrics here, didn't you? I can't help it. I'm the 14-year-old girl who'd fall asleep listening to Neil Diamond on the LP player in her parents' flat in Mumbai. Do you remember when I met you, I asked if you could sing like Neil Diamond, being American and all? You said no. I should have walked away then. It should have been a deal breaker. I broke all the deals I had made with myself. I broke our vows. I broke your heart. Now I am back. You are here. We no longer make promises. And yet, in the sequel to all vows, I take thee to be my lawless love. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Joy Mills has been writing, recording, and performing her balladeering and soulful country songs for over a decade, fronting her own bands, the Starlings and the Joy, Mill band, Joy Mills Band. She has toured nationally and in Europe. She also performs locally with the Bushwick Book Club. Do you guys know what that is? It's really cool. It's awesome. The Bushwick Book Club and appeared in the Lit series a few years ago and has done other special events. And it's my great pleasure to bring her back on stage now. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, just a few words about my approach. I kind of took a trilogy approach with this. I had written the first song right before Peter contacted me about this gig. 
So that was a good starting point. And that was um, sort of where the characters in the movie, we'll say, have the chaos and the apocalyptic nightmare try to get out of town. And this is a song called Echo Locator, where they're trying to find help and find some sort of um, miracle, I guess. I've been looking for love ever since I lost my way Yeah, I'm listening for sounds I know Familiar phrases Is there a message alive in time to save the day? Let it resound short break, order drinks, use bathroom, we have 10 minutes, um, and then we'll have Solma Sharif, more music, and Megan Dom, thank you so much, and books for sale, yes, thank you, the migrating back to their seats, this is the sort of, this is the migratory period, this is the, um, cool, thank you all for reconvening, um, I'm so, so excited about Solmaz Sharif. I booked Solmaz was a very long time ago. It was like early 2016. I contacted her because I had read some of her poems and it was a type of thing where you're reading the work and you, it's, um, I had to stand up. Like you're reading it and then, no, I'm not gonna read this, I had to stand up. In order to, it was a, I don't have that very often. Uh, I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, and so I was like, wow, this, and your book was not yet out. Look was not out. Um, and, uh, 
But then it did come out like later and lots of exciting things happened. But anyways, um, Solmaz's, uh, Solmaz Sharif's work has appeared in the New Republic, Poetry Magazine, the Kenyan Review, Boston Review, and others. Um, and she's been recognized with the Discovery Boston Review Poetry Prize, fellowships from Bread Loaf Writers Conference. Were you fellow this summer? Last summer. And, um, and uh, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. And she's also been awarded an NEA, a Stegner. Uh, and, uh, and she's also uh, been selected to receive the 2014 Rona Jaffe um, Foundation Award, Writers Award, as well as a Ruth Lilly and a Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship. She is currently a lecturer your number of years now for a while it, at uh, Stanford, where she got her Stegner, well, that's what that is, and um, that's where that takes place. And uh, uh, her first poetry collection, Look, which I was just talking about, um, was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2016 and was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, and it's my enormous honor to bring Somas to the stage. Okay, does this work? Everyone can hear me okay? Okay. I'm gonna try a, a kind of weird thing or a new thing. Thank you to Hugo House for letting me experiment. I'm calling it a talk against goodness with two poems, one old, one new, okay? For the most part, I have faith in the political possibilities of poetry. For the most part, I like that a poem lets us stand near each other, not saying much. I think our political conversations could use some more lyrical pressure, some more specificity, more rigor, more music. For the most part, a poem and the editing of it becomes a litmus test for what is just and true. As such, a poem is a series of exclusions, things removed, looked away from. And for the most part, I think this is for the best. But there is one exclusion, one thing I have not allowed into a poem that has given me a crisis of faith in poetry. This one piece the lyric would not accept is where what is good for the poem and what is good for this nation and what can be considered my good behavior line up too neatly. And so I thought a sequel I'd return um, as a shadow rather than move on to the next thing. So I'll begin by reading that poem now. It's called Look. It's the title poem of my book. It's worth knowing that the Department of Defense has its own dictionary and in that dictionary has redefined the word look to mean in mind warfare, a period during which a mind circuit is receptive of an influence. Look. It matters what you call a thing. Exquisite, a lover called me, exquisite. Whereas, well, if I were from your culture living in this country, said the man outside the 2004 Republican National Convention, I would put up with that for this country. Whereas I felt the need to clarify, you would put up with torture, you mean, and he proclaimed yes. Whereas what is your life? Whereas years after they look down from their jets and declare my mother's Abaddon block probably destroyed. We walked by the villas, the faces of buildings torn off into dioramas and recorded it on a handheld camcorder. Whereas it could take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger pulled in Las Vegas and the Hellfire missile landing in Mazar-e Sharif after which they will ask, did we hit a child? No, a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas the federal judge at the sentencing hearing said, I want to make sure I pronounce the defendant's name correctly. Whereas this lover would pronounce my name and call me exquisite and lay the floor lamp across the floor, softening even the light. Whereas the lover made my heat rise, rise so that if heat sensors were trained on me, they could read my thermal shadow through the roof and through the wardrobe. Whereas, it's not like seeing a dead body walking to the grocery store here. It's not like that. It's a rock. You know, it's a rock. It's kind of like acceptable to see that there and not. It was kind of like seeing a dead dog or a dead cat lying. Whereas I thought if he would look at my exquisite face or my father's, he would reconsider. Whereas, you mean I should be disappeared because of my family name? And he answered, yes, that's exactly what I mean, adding that his wife helped draft the Patriot Act. 
Whereas the federal judge wanted to be sure he was pronouncing the defendant's name correctly and said he had read all the exhibits which included the letter I wrote to cast the defendant in a loving light. Whereas today we celebrate things like his transfer to a detention center closer to home. Whereas his son has moved across the country. Whereas I made nothing happen. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life. It is even a thermal shadow. It appears so little and then vanishes from the screen. Whereas I cannot control my own heat and it can take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger, the Hellfire missile, and a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas a dog, they will say, now, therefore, let it matter what we call a thing. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. The 2004 Republican National Convention was held in Madison Square Garden. I flew there to protest. The flight from New York was filled with convention attendees. The seat in front of me was occupied by one, a white woman, while her daughter, an eight or nine year old, sat in the middle seat. This white mother was speaking over her daughter to another white woman sitting in the window seat, making airplane chit chat, thrilled as they were for this journey, new as they were to each other. The mother explained her daughter was adopted as an infant from China and had been enrolled in gymnastics classes in the States as soon as her motor function allowed. You know, the mother added, they practically breed children over there for gymnastics. This sentence passed just above the daughter's head, hiccupless, uncommented upon, and this was not going to be a good trip. <laughs> 7th Avenue in front of Madison Square Gar Garden had been blocked off to protesters. There was an H&M on the corner with an entrance on 7th Avenue and 34th Street. And while protesters were not allowed on 7th Avenue, shoppers exiting H&M were. So I stood there watching convention goers pass by in bolo ties and sequin cowboys hats. There was a suit arguing with a white liberal in khaki shorts on that corner behind the police partition as Madison Square Garden flashed and blared, no joke, play that funky music white boy. They argued about W, about his wars on terror, and when the Republicans said, we've captured thousands of terrorists in Afghanistan and thousands in Iraq, when the Republican offered Guantanamo occupancy rates as proof of American success, and the liberal could only muster, yes, but I jumped in. This was decidedly rude. They were having a private conversation about public concerns in a perfectly civilized manner. I was obviously angry. I want you to understand how furious they must have seen me, though I don't recall yelling, how intrusive. Shrill, likely. I had barged right in, asking how, when not a sing single prisoner had been charged, let alone convicted of anything. He was so sure they were terrorists. I suggested it was last names that were providing proof and said, my last name is such a last name. Should I be sent to Guantanamo? This is what has been whittled down in the poem to yes, and if I were in your culture, if I were from your culture living in this country, I would put up with that for this country, and I did, in fact, fill his that with, you would put up with torture, you mean. What I did not include in the poem was the spectacular litany of torture tactics I asked of him. Do you mean I should be waterboarded? Yes. Do you mean I should be hung by my wrists? Yes. Do you mean I should be sodomized? Yes. Unfaltering, this Republican. Do you mean I should, do you mean you yourself would put me on the plane to Guantanamo? Yes. The pressure the poem placed on this dialogue, I am so far okay with. The point was that in this moment, I attempted to make concrete torture detention with my own soft body, with the Republican's own soft body, and he remained committed. That's our conversation distilled. What could never get into the poem, what I can't seem to get into prose now even without having to meander first, what the most violent betrayal and politically destructive decision this poem made me make, making me question whether a good poem is forever, in fact, irreconcilable with the nuanced reckoning our lives actually depend on, is what the white liberal protester said. He who had, like me, snuck through H&M, but unlike me, had done so, I guess, to hear the other side, to understand where they, where they are coming from. He said to me, nothing. He said to the white Republican while extending his own hand, I don't agree with everything you just said, but I want you to know that I know you're a good person. With each word of a good person, he pumped his hand and shook it in emphasis. He was a protester, meaning he was my best shot. This was not included in the poem, 
because I can only get to this most tired of the trails by exposition and not by, mi not by image, not by music, not by the lifting of a single quote, all setting has fallen away. What to say to keep your interest in it? It was dusk, there were cars, they were fast. It was New York and hot and smelled of asphalt. I was fuming, I was murderous with rage. I tried to turn my head from those white men to tell you something of the world we stood in, but the world was only what he said then which was that he was more concerned with how this admitted torturer might feel about the affront of my presence than he was about justice. I have to talk about that Republican guy a lot to get to the liberal, just to get to his crime, and even then, where's the bang? His is what June Jordan calls a criminal inertia. He is positively deadly and dead, and yet the reckoning we must have if we are to get anywhere worth being in this nation. What I describe now is not new. I think of this liberal when I read Dante's Inferno. Quote, looking again, I saw a banner that ran so fast, whirling about that it seemed it might never have rest, and behind it came so long a train of people that I should never have believed death had undone so many after I had recognized some among them. I saw and knew the shade of him who from cowardice made the great refusal. Straightway I understood and knew for certain that this was the sorry sect of those who are displeasing to God and his enemies, these wretches who were never alive. And I think of my betrayal of an edit when I see the Atlantic reprint, reprint an abridged version of MLK's letter from a Birmingham jail in 2013, wherein they notably cut the following, quote, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is an absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is a presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. This was going to be an essay about translation. It was going to be about a tense I stumbled across in a Persian language textbook in my course of translating Furukh Farukhzad, but that tense now appears instead in a poem. A poem I will read. This poem, deals with my struggle with poetry as a domesticating force, the way form interrupts our speech, not letting us get to the thing itself somehow. My father once pled me to include more humor in my poems. He worries I think of death too much. My name in Turkish means flower that never dies. Anyway, my father pleading more humor, please, and me joking, I don't know any jokes, I always forget the punchline, and then realizing my favorite part isn't the punchline, it's when none of us can remember it, and we stand there together a long time, trying to remember what it is. <laughs> that quiet between us, before what needs to be said is said, and everything is over between us, is where I find myself in America today. This is not a good nation. We are not a good people. Good is not a word that appears once in luck. We shall see what we make of it from here. the master's house. To wave from the porch, to disrobe, to recall Ethel Rosenberg's green polka dotted dress, to call your father and say, I'd forgotten how nice everyone in these red states can be, to hear him say yes, as long as you don't move in next door. To recall every drawn curtain in the apartments you have lived. To find yourself at 33 at a vast expanse with nary a papyrus of guidance, with nary a voice and being used a model. To finally admit out loud then, I want to go home. To have a dinner party of intellectuals with a bell, long-armed, lightly tongued at each setting. To sport your done gown, to revel in face serums, to be a well-calibrated burn victim, to fight the signs of aging, to assure financial health to be lavender sachets and cedar lining and all the ways the rich hide their rot, to eye the master's bone china, to pour diuretic in his coffee and think this erosive to the state, to disrobe when the agent asks you to, 
to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall as the lead vested agent names article by article what to remove, to do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, to say, this is my filmdom, the master's house, and I gaze upon it, and it is good to make do, to discuss desalinization plants and de terroir, to date briefly a, va a VP of a major European bank, a lapsed Marxist, and hear him on the phone speaking in billions of dollars, its residue over the clear bulbs of his eyes as he turns to look upon your nudity, to fantasize publishing a poem in the New Yorker, eviscerating his little need to set a bell at each intellectual's table setting, ringing idea after idea and be the simple footed help rushing to say yes, to disrobe when the agent asks you to, to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall, to say this is my filmdom and it is good to recall the settler who from behind his mobile phone said, I'm filming you for God to recall this sad God, God of the mobile phone camera, God of the small black globe and pixelated eye above the blackjack table at Harrah's and the metal toothed pit at Columbia checkpoint the same, to recall the Texan that held the shotgun to your father's chest, sending him falling backward, pleading, and the words come to him in Farsi, to be jealous of this, his most desperate language, to lament the fact of your lamentations in English, English being your first defeat, to finally admit out, that, out loud then, I want to go home. To stand outside your grandmother's house. To know, for example, in Farsi, the present perfect is called the relational past and used at times to describe a historic event whose effect is still relevant today, transcending the past. To say, for example, Shah dictator bude ast translates to the Shah was a dictator, but more literally the Shah is, was a dictator. To have a tense of is, was, the residue of it over the clear bulb of your eyes. To walk cemetery after cemetery in these states and nary a gravestone reading sonmas. To know no nation will be home until one does. To do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, though you've forgotten what it was. Thank you. When faced alone with trouble, don't turn away, be the bird and sing songs. Love comes from, from your cage. Be the word, and song unwound, and voices bound. No need for joy or glory. Don't keep it contained, unwanted or strained. Love waits for the quiet traveler. This life unfolds, colors fall from the sky on the wings of others. Sing songs where love comes from, lift up, be the word, and songs unwound, and voices bound, no fear of joy. Glory, don't keep it contained, unwanted or strained. Love waits for the quiet traveler. Outside the pale, our journey takes tears for the path that 
earthly as mortals may Who is born again To be alone even then Death always lingers in the shadows Songs unwound And voices bound No new fear of joy or glory Don't keep To the magic of morning, immortal conveyance of the joy and the glory. To say, Joy, do you have CD music for sale? She has music for sale as well, right there. I'm seeing CDs being waved at me right now, um, so don't forget to get those as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so we are now on our final reader um, of the evening, and uh, the confession: I was I'm, I live near the author David Shields, and I was at his house a couple years ago. And he had a galley of Megan Dom's then forthcoming book, Unspeakable, on his desk. And I, I stole it. And I, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> Everything's okay. But I did, I've never stolen a book before, but I did. And I, I think I, I confessed to him later, was like, sorry, I just didn't think, I, I thought you might need it, but I thought it'll be okay. And so everything's okay now. I'm cool with him. He's cool with me. Everyone's cool. But I, I still have it, and it's really great. Um, uh, and I got it before anyone else did, so ha-ha. Um, and um, so Megan Dom is the author of, uh, most recently, Mo Unspeakable and Other Subjects of Discussion, which won the 2015 Penn Center Award, USA Award for Creative Nonfiction. She is also the editor of the New York Times bestseller Selfish, Shallow, and Self-Absorbed, 16 Writers on the Decision Not to Have Children. I mean, not to have kids. Her other books include the essay collection My Misspent Youth and the novel The Quality of Life Report uh, and the memoir Life Would Be Perfect If I Lived in That House. She has written for numerous magazines, including The New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and Vogue, and is an opinion columnist at the LA Times. Recipient of a 2015 Guggenheim and a 2016 NEA Fellowship, she teaches at uh, Columbia University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Right thank you. Um, Thank you all for coming out and sticking around. I think it's like 12.30 my time right now, so um, this is gonna be interesting, not only because it's so late, but I actually finished this on the plane uh, this afternoon. I wrote, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't finish. It was finished before I got on the plane, but um, I did a little, little tweaking here and there. Um, but uh, I just wanna thank, um, thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting me, Peter. I spoke to, to David Shields the other day and there was no sense of animosity or anything like that. Um, he, knew I was, he knew I was gonna be here. Um, and thank you, Tree, and, um, and um, you guys, this was like riveting reading tonight. So um, uh, Sonara and Sol Maz and um, Joy, thank you for, for doing this. Um, I'm really honored to be with you. Uh, so this is actually gonna be, gonna be fiction, believe it or not. Um, I made this up. And uh, I really, it was very rare that I say that. Um, but uh, I don't know, it just kind of took, took on a life of its own. And um, I'm gonna, it's kind it may be like a choose your own ending kind of thing because uh, I don't really remember, <laughs> remember what I did on the, on the plane earlier, so. Um, 
think that's uh, that's all you need to know. It doesn't have a title. We don't have titles, right? We don't have to have titles. No title. Okay. All right. So this is this is called fiction. Okay. <laughs> Not true. Deep down, she had always known that she would be his first wife. Even when they married, the ritual felt more like signing a lease than taking on a mortgage, though she never admitted this to herself, much less to him or to anyone else. She knew how cynical it sounded. It was the kind of thing that causes people to gasp just a little when they hear it, like saying you regret having your children or that you wish your dog would die. But she didn't think this feeling belonged in that category at all. If anything, she felt there was a selflessness to it, a perverse generosity. It suggested that she was willing to be overwritten for the sake of someone else's happiness, that she was willing to be talked about disparagingly by a woman she didn't know, or possibly one she did, though she diverted her thoughts from that notion every time it crossed her mind. It suggested she had the stomach for being relegated to the role of cautionary tale. From here on out, the things her husband appreciated the most in someone else would be the things he'd liked least about her. The next wife would be a relaxed cook, a rigorous comparison shopper, a Bruce Springsteen fan. She would tan easily. The next wife would change lanes on the freeway smoothly and not need to turn the radio down when they were going through a toll plaza. It did not occur to, occur to her to flip the script and imagine all the ways her next partner would be the opposite of her husband. She diverted her thoughts away from anything that might even invite such a thought. She was 49 years old with a 19-year-old daughter. Though she was considered attractive by most reasonable standards, she had at some indeterminate point psychologically removed herself from the subcategory of sexually attractive. Every morning before putting in her contacts, she pressed her face to the bathroom mirror so that in her extreme nearsightedness, she could see and then tweeze out the stiff black hairs that had pushed their way to the surface of her chin overnight. This is totally made up. This is completely fiction. <laughs> this is just one of an increasing handful of age-related appearance issues she kept in steady mental rotation. Another involved what she perceived as a slight flopping of the skin of her lower jaw when she leaned over to pick something up off the floor. Her skin in general had a quaggy quality to it that was new. Nevertheless, she was considering taking up smoking again. She hadn't craved a cigarette in decades. In fact, smokers disgusted her. But it was something she had done when she was young, and she wanted to feel young again. Technically, there was no smoking allowed at Bellflower Arms, the Spanish-style fourplex with no off-street parking, where she'd rented an apartment when she realized she couldn't afford anything else. But there were terraces, and good-sized ones. Each unit had its own, large enough for a small table and a chair. That meant large enough for an ashtray. Two weeks after moving in, she hadn't smoked yet, but she knew it was there for her. The option was on the table, a kind of palliative care plan if she decided to give up whatever fight she was fighting and just try to keep herself comfortable. Of course, she wouldn't want the neighbors to see her or, God forbid, complain about the smoke. It was bad enough that she'd introduced herself to the man downstairs as, quote, both proof and a casualty of evolutionary psychology. He'd looked at her not just blankly, but with a vague air of hostility, as if meeting small talk with smartassery was tantamount to walking into a stranger's home with dog shit on your shoes. He'd merely asked if she'd be living in the apartment alone or with a family. She could have just said, it's just me. Instead, she acted bitter and like she had too much time on her hands and therefore too many opportunities to think about the cause of her bitterness. She acted like all those people she hated on Facebook. What she did not yet know about Bellflower Arms was that every unit at that time was occupied by just one person, and each of those people were divorced or otherwise in some second or third act of their really sort of sorry lives. Those people were Andrea Craven, 
a semi-successful abstract expressionist artist recently abandoned by her philandering wife, Jerry Hirschman, a retired Hollywood prop master, now in his 70s, whose longtime partner Bob had gone to Maui nearly a year earlier, ostensibly for vacation, but called one day to say he would not be coming back for quite some time, and when he did, he would be a woman. There was Patrick Perucci, a mortgage broker who'd moved from his Republican-leaning suburb to this hipster neighborhood after his wife had left him and taken the kids and set up household nearby with a furniture designer who had a man bun and was 420 friendly, whatever that meant. <laughs> but though Roz had met all these neighbors in passing by now, she did not know any of them yet. Moreover, she didn't know the thing that I've come to know and that all divorced or otherwise broken second act or beyond people know about the world, which is that all the most interesting people are also the most devastated. By she, I am talking about Roz Ashton. The, the 49-year-old, performatively bitter, almost but not yet legally divorced public interest lawyer and mother of one. I'm talking about the first year of her separation from Jason Ashton, a 51-year-old performatively enthusiastic. If he walked into a room and Antiques Roadshow was playing on the TV, suddenly he loved Antiques Roadshow. Intellectual property lawyer and father of one to a daughter who happened to vastly prefer her enthusiastic father to her sour, wisecracking, yet not really that funny mother. I am talking about the strange alchemy of bellflower arms, a perfectly nice, if generally, if generally unremarkable, 1930s stucco and clay tile job and the not quite gentrified, but nonetheless not quite affordable Los Angeles neighborhood of Bank Haven. What I know about Roz Ashton and her neighbors at Bellflower Arms, I learned many years later. I am in fact speaking to you now from many years later. I am old and so are they. How much later doesn't really matter, but I can tell you that the era in which the following events took place was one of the strangest in the nation's history. Somehow, for reasons that no one knew, yet somehow everyone had an explanation for, a monster had, but had been put in charge of the country. From there, the citizenry itself grew monstrous in a million different ways. Looking back now, it's hard to believe some of the things that went on. The nation's unrest had metastasized into a kind of cultural derangement. The personal was political, and the political in turn was not just personal, but intimate to the point of violation. To say that everyone took everything personally would be a grievous understatement. Everyone took everything as if they had no skin. The fabric of a nation had turned into a skein of nerve endings. The sad citizens of Bellflower Arms were no exception, though their personal upset tended to distract them from the larger community and national upset that surrounded them. This might have been especially true that year for Roz, who, despite always knowing deep down that she'd end up divorced, felt her new status on her like a recently acquired and incurable virus. You could hardly blame her. People fear divorce the way they fear illness. They look away when they see it in others. They search for evidence of weakness, of moral deficiency, of crimes they can't imagine committing themselves. They tell themselves that given enough healthy life choices, it's possible to lower their odds into, if not negligibility, at least something that will, if it should ever come to that, feel more like a force major than the real statistical possibility everyone knows that it is. Roz had married at 30, young for her particular demographic of overeducated, undercommitted, mostly affluent, aspiring bohemian types for whom 30 was more or less 18 with slightly nicer apartments. She had had her daughter at 32. You can guess the math. It was all good though. No one blinked. In fact, everyone smiled. Roz had felt like an imposter for suddenly being so domestic, so normal, but she'd also been happy, maybe the happiest she'd ever been. 
Contrast this trajectory with that of her downstairs neighbor, Andrea, for whom things went the way they probably would have gone for Roz if Roz hadn't gotten pregnant. Andrea, who was now 45, married at 40. The late marriage had nothing to do with being a lesbian, maybe the legal marriage part, but there was no shortage of commitment readiness among her past lovers. She could have moved in with Jennifer before the ink on their college diplomas was even dry. She had moved in with Lisa, and later with Amy. By sheer coincidence, Amy and Jennifer were now engaged. By the time she met Pam, the idea of marriage felt a bit like collecting a PhD after racking up several master's degrees. Practice serial monogamy well into your 30s, and you've got enough pretend little simulated marriages under your belt that the real thing loses some of its mystique. Still, Andrea spent her 20s and 30s operating under the internalized and not always entirely conscious pressure that all but the most wild-spirited pe young people operate under. The assumption that her social life was essentially a vehicle for finding one singularly qualified person with whom she could enact some version of settling down. Despite all the moving in and moving out, and in her defense, at least one of the cohabitations was technically a favor, filling the spot of a roommate who'd left for Europe, she made quite a big deal of saying she was on no such search. She liked to think of herself as, if not exactly wild-spirited, then wild-spirit adjacent in some manner. But the truth is that Andrea bought into the idea of legally sanctioned lifelong monogamy as earnestly as anyone else. And as much as she could see that it was a very tall order, she thought that waiting as long as possible to marry constituted a sort of inoculation against divorce. Not in the couples who delay marriage have higher success rates sense, but in the sense that she thought that waiting until they were older, and Pam was nearly a decade older than she, meant they'd have less time to grow tired of one another. A lot of the couples she saw splitting up now had been in the saddle together for decades. They had kids leaving home, mortgages paid, last gasps of sexual vitality begging not to be squandered. By the time she and Pam reached the 20 year mark, they'd be too old to bother splitting up. They'd be 60, which seemed to her at 40 less like actual life, but a grayed out silhouette of a life. It only took her until 45 to see the folly in that, to understand that the seeds of 60 planted at birth, are saplings at 20, and by the mid-40s have grown into giant flapping fronds of inchoate physicality, desiccated on the edges, but coursing with some mysterious something in the veins, blood, water, the collective tears of a lifetime. Middle-aged carnal desire is a sweet, capricious beast. Roz would learn this soon enough. She and I are still talking about it, well into our old age. Today, we pine for our middle age. We grieve for its loss, the same way Ross had grieved for the loss of her youth that first year of her divorce. Because there's much to pine for about middle age desire. It's a desire that sometimes feels less rooted in abject carnality than in plain interest. To witness two people of a certain age getting to know one another in a way that might lead to physical intimacy is to see anthropology in action. There is social theory happening here, urban planning, case studies in family law. There is history meeting history. There is baggage being lifted off a carousel and introduced like dogs sniffing each other on the sidewalk. There is no pretense of freshness of blamelessness, of idealizing or being idealized. Coyness, too, seems in the wrong key. First dates cut right to the chase. The real stuff gets trotted out right away. The custody arrangements, the miscarriages, the mortgage payments, the therapy sessions. Instead of talking about the best concert you ever saw, you talk about the day you realized your previous life was going to be just that, a previous life from which only a few residual threads now hang from your shirt sleeves. This is now the story you trot out when you want to signal that you might be willing to let yourself be known. It's the story of how you broke yourself, of how your world sprung a crack right underneath where you were standing. 
and as your story joins the chorus of stories being told and listened to in as many versions as there are broken people to tell and hear it, you slide into a new kind of world. Roz told me about it later. It's a world in which the stiff hide of convention and expectation has softened into supple leather. It's a world that can no longer support pretense, a world where, there's, where those Facebook posts advertising marital bliss are confirmed as the bullshit we always knew them deep down to be. It's a world built on scar tissue, which turns out to be a surprisingly solid foundation. And at some point, without quite realizing it, your life goes from broken to broken in. Shall I tell you about Patrick? He fought the suppleness. He fought it hard. Wisdom born of pain and loss was never something he'd aspired to. He'd grown up with the ground already too loose beneath him. The idea always was to make his adult life as straight and stiff as cardboard. Ironically, or is it more like inevitably, it was the cardboard quality of the life he'd built that his wife decided she couldn't take anymore. In defiance, he dug in his heels. He'd moved to the dipshit hippie neighborhood because that's where she'd gone with the kids, but he more or less refused to unpack. Two years later, there were taped up boxes in the corner of the living room, nary a picture on the wall. The dining table had three chairs, two for each kid, one for him. Every morning he put on a suit and drove to the San Fernando Valley where he once lived and still worked and tried to pretend he was back in his old life. He tried to conjure his old problems, the ones that had seemed like the end of the world before the day he received notice that his world had, in fact, ended sometime earlier, somehow without his noticing. Shall I tell you about Jerry? He was as open-minded as they came as marginalized as he'd thought it possible to be, though he'd never heard that word until recently. He was gay, a Jew, born in the 1940s in a place not exactly Brooklyn or Berkeley. He'd hated Nixon, he'd hated Reagan, he'd hated whoever was hateable that came after that. Though now with the monster, past hates were practically vanishing from memory, like minor illnesses rendered meaningless in the face of cancer. He loved his dog Harvey, a German shepherd mix almost 14 years old and still gunning for a walk every morning, still waiting for Bob to return, Jerry assumed every time he saw the animal splayed out in the doorway, the hardwood floor rubbing the fur off his elbow joints. He liked to joke that he knew what the dog was thinking. The dog was thinking absolutely nothing, which was about as much as he knew. The joke didn't work anymore though, since it had turned out to be sort of true. Jerry didn't know anything. Worse, he didn't understand anything, which is actually far more awful than not knowing. He didn't understand how a man he'd known intimately for more than two decades <clears throat> could have felt like a woman all that time. He didn't understand why, when he told his story at the support group at the LGBT walk-in center, he was reprimanded for saying sex change instead of transition, and later transsexual instead of transgender. When the same tattooed jackass, whose age, sex, race, and even regional accent seemed a total mystery, corrected him for saying that Bob felt like a woman instead of Bob was a woman, Jerry vowed to never come back. Who cared that the center was right in the neighborhood and that he couldn't afford a shrink? He was better off talking to some homo barber at Rudy's. He was better off talking to a bartender Jerry had spoken briefly with the new lady next door, who seemed pleasant, if a little nervous in her chattiness. He thought at first that her name was Rose, which had been his mother's name. When he realized it was Roz, he felt a faint tug of disappointment, and this unsettled him. She seemed interested in Harvey, and they talked about her dog, who was dead now, and about how she was getting divorced and how her daughter was away at college and would probably never spend the night at Bellflower Arms because her husband was keeping the house. He mentioned that he too had had a breakup recently and she said, oh, so you get it, before continuing to prattle on about her reservations about the neighborhood and her annoyance at having to park on the street. Jerry did not tell Roz about the transition. 
He didn't mention that Bob had sent him a two-sentence email a few days earlier saying he was coming back to L.A. briefly and wanted to take Harvey on a walk one last time. Jerry didn't know if one last time meant before Bob had some kind of surgery or before Harvey died, which wasn't imminent, but was something that could plausibly occur before Bob had his gender confirmed or whatever the hell you were supposed to call it. Roz, for all her talking, did not mention why her husband was keeping the house or the real reason her daughter wouldn't stay with her. She did, however, see Jerry on his terrace a few mornings later while she was sitting on her terrace not smoking. He had the newspaper spread out before him, though he wasn't looking at it. Instead, he was staring north toward the low-slung apartment buildings across the street and the San Gabriel Mountains beyond them. Jerry, to her, looked downright elderly in that moment. The newspaper was a geriatric signifier. Just having it in his hands added 10 years. <laughs> What's the latest from the apocalypse, Roz asked. My ex, Jerry said after a pause, is coming today to walk Harvey. Well, that's nice, Roz said. Nice that you're still in touch. We're not really. He lives in Maui. Oh, she said. He's flying 2,500 miles across the Pacific to walk the dog, Jerry said. And Harvey can't really go more than a few blocks, so. I miss my dog, Roz said. I'd fly 2,500 miles to walk him one more time. Jerry looked at his new neighbor. Her hair was unbrushed, and she was wearing a Japanese kimono robe over pajamas. He noticed that she was also wearing clogs. She was an attractive woman, though. Dishevelman actually worked on her. But what a fucking narcissist. Jerry didn't know that Roz went back into her apartment shortly after that and was nearly knocked over by tears that didn't loosen their chokehold for hours. She missed her dog. She'd been, he'd been gone for years now, but the wound still gaped. If anyone had asked her why she was so upset that morning, she would have told you she missed Marlo, that all she wanted to do was get on a plane and fly 2,500 miles to see Marlo again. Of course, anyone, and by that I mean anyone, a third grader, would have known that she was crying about something else entirely. But pets are nothing if not proxies for all those whose emotional load exceeds our bearing capacities. As she and I would discuss many years later, it wasn't until that brief exchange with Jerry on their respective terraces that Roz would begin the process of, of rebuilding her world on scar tissue. It wasn't until later that afternoon, while walking to Trader Joe's because she didn't want to take her car out and risk not finding another parking spot, that she passed a man she'd never seen before walking Harvey. The man was staring straight ahead, as though looking at something in the distance. It made her think of Jerry staring into space that morning on his terrace, and then she realized that this must be the ex. He was past her before he, she could even register what he looked like. She'd been so focused on the dog. She thought of the man returning the dog to its home, driving straight to the airport and flying back to Hawaii. She thought of the strange little ways people hold on to the past, the inconveniences they'll tolerate just to keep a foot on the shifting ground one more moment before the earth splits into two continents. The continent of the past and the continent of this stabbing pain we're apparently supposed to recognize as now. She wondered if the pain was ever going to be anything other than stabbing. She wondered then if being stabbed by life was actually preferable to being numb to it. Or maybe the numbness comes after the stabbing. Or maybe when you're numb, you're actually being stabbed all the time, but don't realize it. And that's how people get through life. In any case, when she returned to Bellflower Arms after her shopping trip, her reusable bags weighed down with almond milk and bananas, she felt the presence of something that hadn't been there when she left. She felt that a weight had been lifted and replaced by a different kind of weight. If she'd been able to describe it, she might have called it a more evenly distributed weight, a weight you could conceivably get used to. It would be a long time before she could put words to it, before she could understand its significance, its essentialness, 
its inevitability and therefore its rightness. She did, however, cross the threshold in the, into the courtyard that afternoon and pick up a scent that brought her a perverse comfort. It was the scent of brokenness. And upon breathing it in, she was gripped by the terrible realization that she was home. Thank you. Thank you. And please, uh, another round of applause for all the readers tonight and the uh, Joy Mills. Thank you. Um, yeah, to learn more about our events, go to our website. We have classes, many classes, many things. And we have, um, yes, and there's drinks, books. Get them signed. Thank you so much. And have a good night. Thank you.